today's episode, the fur trade, and over 150 years of pre-Minnesota history. Meet Bucky Beaver. His family has lived on Earth for a long time, probably hundreds of thousands of years, maybe even millions. For almost as long, humans have hunted and trapped his ancestors for food, fur, and waterproof oil they have in glands in their bodies. But back in the 1500s, hats made from beaver felt, the smooth fur found deep inside the beaver pelt, became very popular in Europe. Little Bucky here got caught up in a worldwide event that would totally transform the planet into what we know it to be today. He did all that without even having to chop down a single tree. So what's up with that title? 150 years of pre-Minnesota history? As we learned in an earlier video, Minnesota didn't get called that officially until 1858 when it became a state. Before that, it was a land with different people making different claims of ownership at different times. The people who lived here longest, the Dakota, are actually the ones who came up with the name Minnesota Makoche. Those different people include the nations of the Dakota, the Ojibwe, the Spanish, the French, the English, and eventually the United States. In Europe, there's a lot going on with different countries trying to claim this land and its resources all for themselves. There's been a lot of war in Europe for hundreds of years, and they've run out of a lot of supplies. So whoever can find a new source of trade and goods should become the dominant power. Countries like India and China are very wealthy, and Europeans really want to get some trade going on with them. They're trying to find a shortcut instead of going around the dangerous southern tip of Africa. It's really only dangerous because of the ocean currents. For thousands of years, people had known the world was round, and another theory was that there was a northwest passage through this continent or around the northern portion. Because European countries were trying to find that path to Asia, this is called the Age of Discovery, even though nothing was discovered that Europeans didn't already know about. The discovery of a route around Africa was already accomplished by the Chinese a century earlier. Either way, here's what went on. Spain. Portugal, France, and England are the countries with direct access to the Atlantic Ocean. In 1492, Columbus is the first European in almost 500 years to cross the Atlantic Ocean. He sets out for gold, but also to colonize. At first, he thinks he's landed off the coast of Asia in an area known as the Indies. He calls the people Indians and makes several more voyages. Portugal gets into the mix as well, and those are the two dominant powers in what comes to be known as the Americas. The original and oldest European languages on this continent are Spanish and Portuguese. After a century of dominating the New World, setting up colonies with over 100,000 Spanish-speaking Europeans, killing thousands of American Indians, and setting up farms, towns, and ports, the English defeat the Spanish in a war and begin heading across the ocean. A few English colonies fail, but Jamestown in 1607 and Plymouth, the Pilgrims among others, in 1620, experience some success. Well, the success came at the expense of many who died, but an English presence on North America begins to build. Meanwhile, the French have been exploring the East Coast and traveling into the Great Lakes. The first known Europeans in what we now know as Minnesota were the French explorers Radisson and Grosselier, who spent the winters of 1659 and 1660 with the Dakota near Lake Mille Lacs. Those guys explored throughout the Great Lakes to set up trade routes for French fur traders. In 1679, after 20 years of building a relationship with the Dakota and the Ojibwe, the French convinced those two countries, those two nations, to sign a treaty of alliance and began trading goods for furs that go back to Europe and Asia. The fur trade has officially begun, and so has one big game of Monopoly. Well, not literally. But you have people with different specialties trying to get the most for their efforts. For example, the Dakota and Ojibwe have lived in this area for hundreds, even thousands of years, and they are masters of trapping fur-bearing animals of all kinds. 
the French and English are newcomers to this area who have been fighting back in Europe for centuries. Their fighting continues, but something war seems to do a lot of is force people to innovate. Steel making is an innovation that first started in Africa and Asia three to 4,000 years ago. Gunpowder is an innovation that first started in China a thousand years ago. Africa, Europe, and Asia are one continuous landmass and the locations of the oldest known civilizations. These civilizations traded, went to war, and competed with one another for thousands of years. As a result, they developed tremendous innovations in weapons, transportation, and trade goods. They also passed a lot of diseases back and forth across all three continents. Those who survived all those different disease outbreaks had immunities that, are, that still made them sick, but made them less likely to die. So, back to the fur trade. Back to the Monopoly game. American Indian tribes like the Dakota and Ojibwe really liked the steel, glass, and gunpowder the Europeans had lots of. The Europeans really liked the, the furs that the American Indians had lots of. They especially liked the beaver pelts that seemed to be easy to get here, but impossible to get back in Europe. Why were beaver pelts in short supply in Europe? Well, they had been largely trapped out. The prevalence of furs through North America was too good to pass up. This would last through the 1700s, but towards the end of that century, major world events began to spell the end of the fur trade. The Dakota and Ojibwe began to get angry with one another over the lands that they were using together. Animals were getting tougher to locate and competition heated up for untrapped fur areas. From 1736 to 1770, these two nations were battling each other along a boundary line that crossed right through modern-day Elk River. Several war parties actually are believed to have camped on the islands of the Mississippi River right here in town. Fighting continued in Europe as well as a major global war taking place between France and England from 1756 to 1763. It was fought in several continents and is considered by many historians to be the first the actual First World War, but it's called the Seven Years' War for obvious mathematical reasons. Fighting in Europe favored the English, and fighting in North America also favored the British. When the war finished, with the British winning, they claimed Canada, and most of what we now know as the United States, from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Mississippi River. Interestingly enough, this war is what the English were demanding the colonists to pay for that upset them to the point of a revolution. The British basically said to the American colonists, well, we beat the French for you, and now you will be able to make more money as British subjects, so help pay for this war. This angered a few colonists, right? They were able to get enough people to agree with them by 1775 that a revolution started. In 1776, the Declaration of Independence was issued, and after eight difficult years of a war that featured more British victories but just the right American ones, England agreed to give the colonists control of what was starting to be called the United States of America. Things in Europe were changing. Tastes in fashion were changing. It was getting less and less stylish to have beaver felt hats, and even though American fur trading companies existed toward the end of 1700s and the early 1800s, the fur trade was slowing down. The United States now extended westward to the Mississippi River, and government expeditions started pushing into the area looking to build military forts and possibly purchase the land to become part of the newly formed nation we call home. Fur traders started to become land buyers. One of the tricks by these fur traders was to trade with American Indians and tell them that they can pay later. This would make the American Indian in debt to the fur trader, and those debts would later be used to buy the land. In exchange for your debt, you can sell us your land. By the early 1800s and into the 1820s and 1830s, the fur trade was a small market. This is when the United States started buying the lands around here. It still wasn't called Minnesota by the United States, but there was quite a lot going on in this area for 300 years of history. A lot of people don't think about that. There was so much going on here for so long before it was the United States and Minnesota. But that's what happened, and it led to everything else we're going to study about this year. These events are tied to the American Civil War, World War I, World War II, people exploring into space, your family coming to Minnesota, and us being here right now watching this video. Who would have thought a little old beaver would have made such an impression? Okay, let's take a little review time here. Why was this interaction, known as the fur trade, a source of conflict and tension between European nations and indigenous nations? By the way, indigenous means always lived here or native. Okay, the answer is pretty simple. 
There were limited resources, and when that happens, people get tense with one another. When their tensions boil over, it leads to conflict. Beaver pelts were always in supply, but competition became fierce to get them. Trade goods from Europe, Asia, and Africa were in short supply. As the fur trade got bigger, as people depended more and more on things they traded for, they became more eager to edge each other out. American Indians did not always get the same price from French, British, and American fur traders, and so they would compete to trade for the best prices. As the French, British, and Americans fought various wars with each other, the tensions between those countries spread into the fur trading posts and the woods where the trappers lived. Later, this tension would show up as American Indian trappers were forced to southern lands to the United States fur traders in exchange for forgiving debts. Well, that was a good answer, good answer. So why did Europeans want furs, and why did indigenous people want manufactured goods? Why did the French and the British and later the Americans want furs, and why did the Dakota, Ojibwe, and other tribes want manufactured goods? Tell me that. Europeans wanted furs because they were very valuable in Europe, and they were very valuable in Asia and Africa. Europeans wanted to get more furs to trade with countries in Asia and Africa. Indigenous people like the Dakota and Ojibwe wanted manufactured goods because they were more convenient than the stone and wooden tools that they were used to. Metal tools and weapons, metal traps, glass beads, and other manufactured goods were stronger and more durable in most cases. Basically, the Europeans had a lot of trade goods, so it was nothing for them to trade them. The Dakota and Ojibwe, along with other indigenous people, had lots of furry animals they trapped, so it was nothing for them to trade them. Both had something the other wanted, and that's how trade occurs. Minnesota, 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 Minnesota.